welcome to the nonprofit show. We are so glad you're starting your week with us, or maybe not starting your week if you found this on many of our streaming platforms. I am thrilled to have Nicholas Meekins join us, joining us today. Nick serves as the co-founder and CEO at Lux Give, and he's here to share with us about fundraising with luxury travel and what that looks like for your NPO. So stay with us. And before we dive deep, we want to remind you, our viewers, as well as our listeners across the globe, who we are. So hello to Julia Patrick. Julia is the CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy that had this wonderful idea that when she created it, I'm not so sure I thought it was wonderful, but I stuck with it. I'm Jarrett Ransom, <laughs> your nonprofit nerd, CEO of the Raven Group. And we did start these episodes in March of 2020, and they are, as we've re referred to them, a going Jesse. We're coming up on 800 episodes, our fourth year, and just so excited for the the levels and the layers of conversations that we've been um, able to have. Thank you to our amazing presenting sponsors that allow us this platform in conversation. So a huge shout out of gratitude goes to our friends at Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, nonprofit thought leader, fundraising academy at National University, staffing boutique, nonprofit nerd, and tech talk. So there's so much going on in our world, and we are so grateful to have the ongoing support, the investment by these sponsors, and not just here for the show. They're really here for you and for your mission to help you do more good. So do us a favor, do them a favor, and please check out these companies. Hey, I mentioned how many uh, episodes we've produced, and you can find them on Roku, YouTube, Vimeo, Amazon Fire TV. And for those of you that are podcast listeners, I know I am, you can queue us up wherever you stream your podcast as well. Just tell that little smart person in your, in your TV or your telephone, hey, pull up the nonprofit show. And in fact, this show, the one that we're doing live right now with Nicholas, will be on in just a few hours on all of these streaming platforms. So without further ado, again, I really want to welcome to today's episode, Nicholas Meekins, co-founder, CEO at Lux Give. Welcome, Nick. Hi, Jarrett and Julia. Thanks for having me. How are you? Thank you for being here. Um, we are fantastic. This is a conversation I've been looking forward to. I've um, had the privilege of speaking with your co-founder, Bobby, and really nerding out about this topic. But for our viewers and listeners, would you please share a little bit about yourself, Nick, and then a little bit about Lux Give as we dive into the conversation? Sure. Happy to. Um, I am CEO, co-founder of Lux Give, but I think more importantly, father to two beautiful little girls. And um, yeah, I, I have come from the luxury travel industry, and that's really my background. Um, before then, though, I was a volunteer worker. My parents were volunteer workers in both India, Africa, in Ghana, and in uh, Argentina. So I kind of grew up on the field uh, doing voluntary work uh, with them. And then I moved myself into a completely different industry, which is the luxury travel industry. Mm -hmm. And uh, only as of like four years ago, really found how we can marry that together with fundraising and supporting nonprofits and being part of the positive change, which um, is incredible for, for me to be part of. Um, and then, yeah, we started uh, Lux Give uh, about four years ago to 2019, just before something happened in the world. I don't know what it was, but you know, everyone <laughs> shut down thing. and uh, everyone was covering their mouth. And I'm, I'm not sure exactly what happened, but um, I know what wasn't happening along with that was events and travel. So um, it actually gave us some time to to build out our product a bit better and um, just more completely. And we'd already we already seen um, the effect that we could have with our product and with luxury travel in the fundraising world. And so it was more a matter of, okay, well, I think the world's gonna open up again at some point, so we'll be ready when they are. And uh, I come, you know, fast forward a year and a half later, that's what happened. And now we're seeing just incredible growth. Um, our team now is almost 40 people, which is crazy to think. Uh, a year and a half ago, we were four or five people. And um, and yeah, there's no real sign of slowing down here. And, and really what we put that down to is the effectiveness of our ability to be able to, to fundraise for the nonprofits that we're working with. And um, yeah, what we do is provide luxury travel experiences for them at their events, which we're going to go into more detail, I assume. <laughs> so talk to us then about that, because your story is is fascinating that you would um, have an idea and you'd be all good to go and then just, you know, run up against this brick wall. 
that really change the trajectory of your company as all nonprofits. And I've got to believe there's some pent up demand here that's going to work in your favor. But step back and talk to us about how luxury travel really can fit into fundraising. And, and more importantly, now at this point in time, when we're going back to the gallows. Absolutely. Um, as you said, we've gone through a journey here, uh, which has been changing and been shifting underneath us. Um, we are now in a place, I feel, though, that we're almost back to normal, I think, across the board. There's been some slight changes, I think, uh, you know, some evolutions, I think, as we've come uh, through the years, that now people are starting to do more hybrid events, as an example. So they've gotten comfortable with with promoting their their events online and delivering them in, a, in that kind of format. So now it's like, why not? We reach your wider audience for those people that aren't there on the night. So uh, with that aside, though, I think those in-person events are really back in full flow uh, from what we've seen. And um, I, I, I think as of last year, there were still probably people that were, were not having events as a result of something that happened in the world. Um, but uh, but I, I, I'm not hearing that now. So, so that's huge. Yeah. And, you know, how does that fit? And I guess with luxury travel, it's, uh, it's a bit it's an interesting question because Again, four years ago, I'd probably been like, hey, can you tell me how this fits in? Um, but, uh, you know, I think at that time, uh, I was, you know, at, at a fork in the road, so I think from my career as well. We had, I'd worked with um, two of the top companies for luxury villa vacations, that was luxury retreats. Um, and uh, they were subsequently sold to Airbnb, became Airbnb Lux, and just really had the very high end stuff. It's a sort of separate platform of theirs. Um, and then Travel Keys, which was the number two player really in the industry at that time as well. And then a core hotel, a big hotelier, came and bought them up. Um, and at that point, I'm like, okay, well, what do I do? That's my industry. That's why I know we can do that again. Um, and then I can't really stumbled across the consignment uh, world and, and, and the fact that you can actually use these to raise funds. Uh, for nonprofits, and and this immediately spoke to me. Um, we'd already had a, a bit of interest before in our previous lives uh, from nonprofits asking us to create villa experiences for them for their for their events, um, but they were doing all the running around. They were doing all that work of trying, like, okay, I need this, I need that on top. Oh, how much would it cost if I open it for this much period of time? Which was a different pricing model than what we were used to. Which was like, hey, hi, Jared. You know, you would like Jamaica from the 7th to the 14th of April. Okay, this is what's available. How many bedrooms do you need? And, and it was very specific. So um, doing all that run around the, the back end work to create something of great value for nonprofits. Um, that was something that we felt we could do uh, using our current uh, network of homes. And we had access to over 10,000 know, of the top villas and homes, chalets around the world, private islands. So uh, we went to work putting together these experiences. And um, that's the part that we knew. So that's that we were comfortable with. Like, well, I can get you the best stuff anywhere in the world that I know. I know hospitality. This is what I've been doing. You can do it with our eyes closed, with our one hand behind the back. Not as good with two hands, but uh, still. <laughs> Um, and, and what we had to figure out then was what do the nonprofits need? You know, that was the part that we really need to understand. That's what we've gotten a lot better at over the last four years. And um, so, you know, we took at their events and we're looking, what's their goals from, from these events? And, um, you know, what we saw was that these events are really being held to bring together their key donors and, uh, you know, build and reinforce those relationships, you know, thank them for their generosity over the year. I mean, they, they rely on these donors uh, throughout the year, um, give them some excitement, some entertainment, and ultimately, thank you for, for, for what you're doing. And then almost as a sidebar to raise some funds in, in that event as well. Um, you know, they'll receive donations throughout the year independently of this. So sometimes for a lot of nonprofits, this isn't where they make, you know, the most. Um, this, is, this is an event that they want to build those relationships, you know, build up that rapport, say hi in person, thanks, you know, feel the camaraderie, uh, the community around them, around that cause. Um, and, you know, uh, therein, you know, the, when we were talking about the raising funds, yeah. we saw that there was a few different ways that they do that. The sponsorships, you know, for one, paddle raise being very, very effective way of raising funds. And then there was these raffles and auctions. Um, and the high ticket items were always the travel ones. So this is where it's like, bing, okay, this works. Um, and what we saw were, you know, very similar uh, and repetitive, I guess, options coming up in these events, uh, you know, hotel based ones, and, and they're good, um, you know, resorts and everything. But 
I guess where where we saw the opportunity for the nonprofits and us um, was that when I look at a hotel, I, I kind of know how much it's worth, you know, in some way. You know, if I say, you know, a, a Fairmont for for a night, how much is it one night a hotel? Five hundred bucks? I don't know. Like right in my mind right now, I could I could probably put somewhere, you know, uh, a pin on like where it would be. Um, and most people will as well. Whereas if I tell you four bedrooms in Turks and Caicos on the beach for eight people. Oh, wait, that could be $100,000. It could be $5,000. Like, who knows? Honestly, it's like, how long is a piece of string at this point? Yeah. Um, and so that's where we saw, okay, because the, it's less quantifiable, I think these these homes and these, these experiences, um, it makes it much more effective tool for fundraising. And uh, that was the part that really stuck with us. And again, you know, got some good product market fit just before the, the world shut down. And that made us think, you know, we're onto something here. Let's continue making these, these uh, experiences and build a system that we can scale for when the world opens up. And um, so far we've seen it really work. You know, we're um, you know, 140% raise over the consignment price, uh, which is interesting. And I know you had spoken earlier about um, multiples um, and, and how we might be able to make those more effective. But um, yeah, so that's really how they fit together. Uh, tapping into the donor's travel budget and, um, you know, these are people that have disposable income. That's why they're donating thousands in the first place uh, and making sure that you give them the sort of experience that uh, they're looking for. You know, I'm really curious, and you had mentioned tapping into the donor's travel budget. Let's talk about the demographic of these donors, um, because I'm really curious, you know, with this pent up demand or interest to travel, has that demographic shifted? So what is the demographic truly of donors as, you know, specifically for the luxury travel? Um, interesting question. Again, it's, it, it is a sort of how long is a piece of string question because it varies <laughs> so wildly. Um, and, and I think it kind of goes back to what is luxury in the first place uh, for us. And um, this is a question that's constantly being raised. What is luxury? What does it mean? And if I look at, uh, you know, for me, that varies from one destination, from one experience to the next, wildly. Like if I look at what we have in Patagonia, okay, you got no Wi-Fi, you got no pool. That's unacceptable if you're in St. Bart's. Right, uh, right, you know? exactly. Uh, but I'm in Barbados, I got staff. No, you're not going to get that in St. Bart's, you know? So so it depends on where you are, what you're looking at is uh, it defines what luxury is. But ultimately what we see is that, you know, these people, they're of a demographic demographic that they know what they want um, and they expect consistency, reliability uh, for one, good communication. We, they want us to understand their needs and respond to those and, and be proactive about that. And obviously with a little bit of flair to show them they're special, these people like to be a bit, you know, pampered. Uh, it doesn't have to be something crazy, but you know, you hear that, you know, their favorite thing is cookies and cream. Okay, put that by the side of the bed or something like this. Oh, wow, that's all you need sometimes. It's just something to show them that they're special. Um, but the demographic uh, of, of people, it, it is wildly, it varies across the board. And, you know, we work with a lot of um, you know, private schools uh, as nonprofits. And, you know, these are all in that category that they will take these sort of vacations. They expect the best. Um, and what that is depends on the person, to be honest. You know, some people are quite happy to go to Patagonia and do some glamping. Others, absolutely not. And that's where it's about understanding your donor and speaking to, you know, us as the travel experts of, of knowing, okay, well, you know, this would appeal to this range, this would appeal to that range. Um, we also have uh, winner's choice packages, which uh, sounds like that's what the winners choose, but actually what it is, is that the winner gets to choose from a variety of different experiences. So that appeals to a wider base as well. Some, you know, some people want to go domestic, other people want to go, you know, skiing and others just want the beach. Um, and so, and so we, we create these to try and appeal to a wider range uh, of people and it's understanding their needs. And again, providing them with that consistency, uh, speaking to the nonprofits, you've got to understand that these are their most prized assets, the donors, and they, you know, it's not worth the five, $10,000 they're going to get from that trip that you sold for them. Um, if you ruin the relationship or if you damage their trust. So they need, you need to take care of them the best possible, make sure that um, when things go wrong, because things inevitably will sometimes go wrong, you are there and you have a response and you can make it right. And so then, let me ask you this question, because, you know, for those of you that are watching or maybe just jumped on, the ecosystem of this transaction really is occurring at a gala or an event, correct? Where there's an auctioneer and there's some sort of engagement. 
with that group in that ballroom or meeting room, whatever, how are you seeing some of these hybrid events or online auction pieces, or is the travel still being held to the live auction piece? Um, we, we've seen it diversify um, definitely in recent months, uh, in the last year really. And um, it's still predominantly more effective, I think, in a live auction environment. Um, it, it is, uh, you know, when you're shopping online um, and you have that moment to be like, okay, well, what do I want? You know, is that is these four or five options that the, my nonprofit has offered me really going to be like, okay, that's what I want? You'd have to get pretty lucky in in some cases. Okay. Um, and, and we do have some that would do well in that environment, which are which are definitely much more um, you know unique, experiential sort of uh, packages for that. But I think in the live auction, again, it's the camaraderie. You know, you you have your cocktail, you're competitive against the person you know on the other table, <laughs> um, and, and you and you want to support your cause. And and I think that's where you get the the thanks and you get the recognition there and and that's where we see it is very effective and on the back end what we do to kind of solve to the problem of like well did we hit this on the on the head like just out of chance or not um what we do on the back end is we try and tailor that for them so when they come to us and we fulfill it um we don't say hey sorry julia you got five nights in turks and Caicos, of two bedrooms doesn't matter if you want three bedrooms or you want a six nights no what do you like we have access to the world here um and these kind of donors these high net worth individuals they don't like to be told no they don't like to be told okay well it costs you 800 dollars more for this or something okay oh well that's what i want and this is their time they want to maximize it they don't want to be told you're going to fit in this little box over here and that's it um and so what we do as a result is we get people much happier with their trip because we're able to customize it exactly for them um after the fact as opposed to going to the nonprofit and a lot sometimes they'll know their donors really well okay this person we made a trip for um, there was one of the Andy Roddick Foundation that I think sold for four hundred thousand um, dollars. They raised hundreds of thousands of dollars off that uh, package alone, and that was custom. Um, seeing, going to the Australian Open, meeting sure. pros, vineyard tours, all this kind of helicopter tours. It was it was all out. Um, when it's at that level and you know your donors and you're speaking to a few people, sure. If not, we try and make it a little bit more generic because after the fact, that's when we put our magic touch on it uh, because everyone's different and we're not going to try and guess your needs without having spoken to you. I think that's just a faux pas in hospitality in general. Yeah, interesting. Well, let's talk then, you know, a little bit more about these costs that are associated with it, as well as the process of travel, because I hear you say, you know, LuxGive really does uh, pay that attention to the donor specifically. Um, So talk to us about these associated costs, if you would, Nick. Absolutely. And this is this is the difficult part, I think, of, of coming up with the experiences, honestly, was was the pricing of it and how to get this right. What's the balance? Because you're, you're kind of you've got two clients. One is the nonprofit. You want to raise as much funds for them as possible. Um, but then you have to bridge the gap between whatever you raised, um, because, you know, we'll have like a three thousand dollar, four thousand um, dollar experience uh, cost to the nonprofit that will easily sell for twelve, fifteen thousand dollars. Now, there's a big gap between the two. And even with the discount that the nonprofit get for what we're offering them, there's still a gap because we're doing our job so well and, and raising funds for the nonprofits. Now, now, how do we bridge that gap, I think, is the, is the twofold. So I think that the first thing is we keep the core costs as low as possible. Um, so we don't include flights, as an example. Now, that's an exclusion. We never include flights. Um, the reason for this is it just adds so much extra cost and, and little value. Anyone can book their own flights, and the, and the cost we'd have to build in would have to be based on the most expensive, really. Right. So so it doesn't add very much value. Um, it doesn't raise more funds for the nonprofit. And so we're like, no, we don't do that. What we do include is is all the extras. No one likes to be told, oh, and then this, and then this, and then this. And i am actually been victim of that recently when I was ch- checking out some experiences. We took part of it on a cruise um, to see if we wanted to include it in our, in our offerings. And um, I think it would be a resounding no at this point. But um, there was this like add-on and add-on and add-on yeah. extra fees. You know, oh, there's this cleaning fee and there's this mandatory gra- a gratuity fee and there's this and there's this. And it's like you walked away feeling like you've been gouged. Um, and so we include all of our taxes, all cleaning fees, every, all the extras. There's no, okay, and you need to, a booking fee or a service fee or anything like this. Um, the only extras that we charge is if you want more. And, and this is what we try and do as well is, is keep it to a minimum. 
make these packages simple because if you start adding one, two, three, four experiences on, you're going to have to get lucky for that. Those would be the four experiences that these people want to do anyway. Mm -hmm. Now, everyone will go and want to, you know, I want a wine tour. Sure. And that's no problem. We'll have a wine tour in Sonoma. That makes sense. But if you start adding on and then this meal and then that meal, well, what if they are allergic to that food or, you know, they don't like sushi or, you know, pizza, like, uh, I don't know. Um, these people will go to restaurants anyway. They will go and, and book two or three <laughs> other experiences for themselves, um, you know, pre-stocking the grocery or fridge what do you want? You know, if I just guess for you, I'll get half fit right. And you've been like, ah, oh, that was a waste of funds. Again, the nonprofit's not winning and the donor's not winning. So that's really what we try and do to get the best uh, pricing for that. Um, obviously you have very long windows to travel, which we build into it. And that's based on our relationships with our suppliers that we're able to do that. Um, and ultimately I think one of the biggest value adds here is the concierge service. So that's something that's very underrated and it was something that was absolutely essential in our previous lives to provide real value was having the concierge uh, team be able to basically be a trip designer. You know, these people know the areas, they know the best places to go. They, they, they have all the best connections to suppliers. You know, oftentimes they'll provide you with discounts because like, oh, they have the best boat charters and these people love us. So it's like, because we're signing a business all the time and they're like, oh, give them 20, 30% off. Like, Perfect. Hey, by the way, you get this sort of discount. So they get extra value just from the referrals. You know, they'll talk to the winners and be like, okay, what are you going for? Is it celebration? Is it just relaxation? And then based on that, they'll they'll make the recommendations. And we just had someone in St. Martin who wanted to get um, uh, proposed to, to their fiance, or sorry, to their girlfriend. And uh, he was like, oh, I just want this, this, and this, very simple. And our, our concierge, uh, she was just like, okay, I heard you tell me this, but what you actually mean is this, this, and this. And she went all out, planned everything for them. And you know, had like a, a band. He wanted something playing from an iPhone. She's like, no, we're getting a band. No, we're doing this. We're doing this. And just knocked it out of the park. And they came back flabbergasted. Like, wow, there, there's the extra value um, for, for that. And that's what's included. Obviously, she service. said yes, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. She said yes. It was a resounding yes. It might have worked with the iPhone, but it wouldn't have been the same thing. You know, yeah. <laughs> you know Nick, it's really interesting because I think it's what I, I, I want to be very clear on this. And that is, is that a nonprofit, a development director, can hand over this transaction. Because I think a lot of times with travel, you know, the development team is like, oh man, I'm going to have to totally get in the weeds on this. But what I hear you saying is that with, you know, the handover, that's removed. That, that aspect is managed outside of the nonprofit. That is absolutely mandatory <laughs> for yeah. us. We don't want them getting involved, to be honest. It's much smoother, much easier. This is what we do, you know, just even from like availability questions and like, right. you know, transferring over from one destination to another, we allow that as well. But, you know, let me talk to them, see what they're like, you know, what what, what are you looking for? We can recommend the best destinations based on your profile and, and everything like that. But um, yeah, no, it's completely, you know, plug and play. Um, and on top of that, you know, I, I completely get the donated trips and the value there. Um, but then, you know, who's doing the, 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 the linens, who's doing the toiletries, you know, who's doing the check-in, who's doing, you know, the, there's a lot of different pieces. Are you booking the transfers? Are you asking the owners now for availability and checking, making sure that they're booked off? And there, there's a lot of moving pieces that um, we feel that the nonprofit's time are better spent building their relationships um, with their donors and the relationships with the donors instead of like, doing what we do for a living, which is travel. The other thing I want to mention to this, because I, I feel like, you know, I, I hear and see this quite a bit, Nick, is the development team or the development committee, right? Volunteers will say, we can't do, that's too expensive, right? And so yeah. I feel like we development are often adding these auction items with our budget in mind, as yeah. opposed to the donor's budget in mind. Yeah. So I love when you said, you know, like really know your audience. Any tips on that, Nick? Because I, I would love to see Lux give, you know, at many more of these events, and to get that kind of paradigm shift from maybe I development person can't afford this, but we have a whole room of donors that absolutely are craving this experience. Can you talk to us about that briefly? Absolutely. And um, I can actually speak this and compare it to our previous lives where that's who we dealt with. Um, right. And on average, uh, the average um, 
expense that we would have on the accommodations alone was $12,500 for our clients. Um, now that is way higher than any of the packages that are the average of packages that we sell. Um, and I think this comes down to exactly that mentality, like they can't afford it, you know? Um, and it's, you know, if you're just giving generic stuff, fine. I understand, you know, people aren't going to be, be bidding that high, but when we're talking about an elevated experience here with the kind of, you know, um, pre-marketing that you need to do, you have to get people excited about this, uh, videos. We love uh, having videos, uh, whenever anyone has like a video wall, please put on videos that that's what sells the experience. We show actual photos of, of the residences and experiences that they're going to be on. Then, then you realize that, okay, the budget that you have in mind um, may not be realistic with what you know these people actually are able to afford. Um, Twelve thousand five hundred dollars is very normal. That was our average, and you know if we drop that down to five, six, seven thousand, you know we hear a lot of nonprofits like, oh, I don't know about that. And like that's because you know that is travel. That's that's what it costs um, at the moment, and and that's a good experience uh, to have. So. Um, one thing that we look at is ticket price as well. So, you know, that's a usually good indicator uh, of, you know, what kind of caliber of donor you're going to be getting in the room. Um, but as a, as a strategy, as a tactic, we do often suggest that, that you have a couple bands, like especially if you haven't done this before, don't put all your eggs in the basket with one really high end one, have like that lower end, have that medium and have a high end. And then, you know what, next, next year, you know, after the event, we're going to like say what worked, what didn't. Okay, and then we're going to come back and we're going to tweak and we're going to optimize because we want to make sure that you're raising more year after year. That's the goal. And um, and we will look at, oh, wow, that $12,000 one sold like crazy. Mm, you should probably get just two high end ones now next year or something like that. And raise an extra 50 grand. So before we let you go, because we don't have that much time left, what is the actual or the, the average um, revenue share situation? You, you At the very beginning, I thought I heard you say 140 percent. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So walk, walk us through that really quickly. So, so what we're saying there is that uh, based on the consignment price, uh, and this is per experience. When, when you're, when you, I'm not talking about like multiples or anything like this at this point, because obviously then it just gets higher. Um, but what we're doing is we're looking at the cost of the experience. So if you have a four thousand dollar package, how much does that sell for? That's going to be 140 percent above that $4,000. So you're now raising 140% of that 4,000, meaning that you're gonna be taking home just shy of $6,000 um, for, for that one package. So, so that's our average raise. I know that when I did some original research, the consignment industry does sort of land around 40%, um, I think. And you know that's still good. Um, I, I think we have to get nonprofits, uh, a lot of them, off the idea that you know this is you can only have eight percent expense ratio or right. something like this because right. because that's not how business runs. Like they have to operate as a business. You got people running this, and you know they need a salary. You know you, you, they're. I think that's something that has to change in the nonprofit world so that we can have more efficient nonprofits. Um, it's not just about how much uh, is donated. Like it has to be like you're running it as a business sometimes. And this is the perfect example where do you want to spend your time hunting down that? Do you want to spend your time now fulfilling these trips, perhaps not having the best experience, perhaps damaging that trust with your with your donor? Instead, you know, look for other solutions. If you don't if you don't do consignments, look for underwriters or sponsors for it. And you know, I've had uh, some people who was like a real estate, um, there was a real estate donor in the room and they asked, you know, would you want to sponsor this? And so they had their name up there on the screens, so this right. Turks and Caicos uh, experience and they're associated with it. And that means hundred percent of it goes to the nonprofit, the raise, because that's been sponsored. So there are ways around it, but I think we just need to be more creative um, with that. And um, yeah, I, that's a, a very good ratio for us, the 140%. Well, I don't know about you, Jared, Jer but I'm ready to like pack a, ba <laughs> uh, a bag and get going, get that dusted off because it, it's been too long since we've been traveling. It's been a while. And for those of you that are listening and thinking about this for your events happening in the near future, I know we have a big, you know, push again in the fall, but 
events are on, travel is on, um, you know, there's a lot of, of energy around wanting to travel. So Nicholas Meekins, thank you. And for your entire team, I just, you know, really pleased to hear the growth and success that you're having. So for those of you watching and listening, Nicholas serves as the co-founder and CEO at LuxGive. Check them out. That's LuxGive.com. Take a look at the experiences that they offer. Uh, really fantastic. I, I love the model. I love you know, the, all of the extra touches that go into this. So thank you for being here and sharing sharing this experience with all of us. Thank you, Jarrett. Thank you, Julie, for having me. Hey, it's been a lot of fun. Again, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. I've been joined today by the nonprofit nerd herself, Jarrett Ransom, CEO of the Raven Group. Again, we wanna thank all of our partners who are with us day in and day out as we travel the globe, right, Jarrett? Each and every day, we have viewers from around the world. And those are supported by Bloomerang American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, nonprofit thought leader, fundraising academy at National University, staffing boutique, nonprofit nerd, and Tech Talk, one of our new sponsors. So we're very, very excited about that. This has been a fabulous show, a great way as we're changing seasons to look at some of the different ways that we can be engaging our donors. So Nick, thank you so much for engaging with us. Thank you again. Hey, it's been a lot of fun. As we like to end every episode, we want to remind ourselves, our viewers, our listeners, everybody to stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here tomorrow.